Hey, y'all, you listen to the Gary Owen Podcast. <laughs> Hashtag get some. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. You can listen to, listen to this on iTunes. Just uh, search Gary Owen, hashtag get some, or you can watch it on my YouTube page, youtube.com backslash Gary Owen com. I always say it. Who's ever got Gary Owen is not coming off that. So I got it. I got my page is Gary Owen com, C-O-M at the end. Uh, recording this, as always, at Timeless Recording Studios. You want to follow them on social media. It's uh, at Timeless R Studio, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I am. I think I'm the only one that does the podcast in this. This is really, really a spot where musicians and rappers. If you can see the other side of this camera, it's a real studio here in Cincinnati. It's a real deal with security and the big studio doors. Like I gotta get, I gotta, I gotta get um, buzzed in. So it's kind of dope. I'm just glad there's no Suge Knights in this area because it'd be kind of scary. Can you imagine getting like fucked up and you're doing a podcast? It'd be the worst. It'd be like the ultimate L. Um, this weekend I'm in Tacoma, Washington at the Tacoma Comedy Club, uh, August 9th to the 12th. And it's crazy because there's a, there's a comedy club in Seattle. Well, Bellevue is, is like a, a nice suburb of Seattle. And then Tacoma, I never knew this. Tacoma is as supposedly the hood in Seattle. Like they'd be wilding in Tacoma. Uh, and it's very much like you got Dallas and Fort Worth. And they, they, when you fly into Seattle, it's called the SeaTac Airport, Seattle, Tacoma. I never knew there was two cities like that. I never knew. It's like San Francisco and Oakland. They're right next to each other, but completely different. Like, I've been to Seattle. I've been to Tacoma. Completely different cities. They might well be on the other side of Earth, just like just like Seattle and Oakland really have nothing in common. Uh, I think the, the big news this week was LeBron opening up the I Promise School. Uh, yeah, now... I'm just going to read what this school entails. It's one thing to have open up a school, but this school, free tuition, uh, free uniforms, free bicycle and helmet because LeBron said when he was growing up, he could always get on his bike. And when he was riding his bike, it, it, it just took his mind to a different place. He wasn't broke. He wasn't there. There wasn't the chaos and the drama and the, the poverty and the plight of, of Akron. Uh, he said when he's on his bike, it was just, everything was okay. So he wanted all the kids to have a bike and I'm sure LeBron didn't have a helmet. There's no way, uh, back then, uh, free tan- transportation within two miles of the school, free breakfast, lunch, and snacks, food pantry for the families, GEDs and job placement services for parents. That, that to me is huge. Um, and guaranteed tuition to the University of Akron for every student who graduates. So I've, I heard this was 10 years in the making. This didn't just happen overnight. Uh, to me, the, the things that stand out that put, tells you all the thought that went into this school is uh, the food pantry for families. Cause we are, you know, I, listen, I gave a kid a scholarship last year. Uh, it was, and, and when I saw what LeBron did with the school, now my, what I did was on a much lower scale, but I wanted to give a scholarship to a kid that didn't have a 4.0, wasn't a great athlete, because it seems like those are the kids that get the uh, the scholarships. But I was always under the mindset of, what if a kid's got like a 2.5 GPA, has an average ACT score, but the circumstances uh, of him going home and not eating and not having a structured home life I wonder what would happen to a kid like that if he if he didn't have to worry about where he was going to eat or uh, how he's going to pay for tuition and school loans and all that stuff. So I remember last year I I, I gave this kid a, a full ride to Capital University and he's going into his sophomore year now. And his story blew me away. I'm going to get back to LeBron's, but uh, this kid's story, uh, his name is Jesse Bailey. He went to the high school I went to, Talawanda High School in Oxford, Ohio. And man, like, like his story is unbelievable. Like parents wasn't really around mom on and off of drugs. Uh, at one point he was living in a tent in the woods because, uh, that's where his dad was living. And then he was standing with his grandfather in, in, uh, in the trailer park. And what's crazy, same trailer park I grew up in, his grandpa had a trailer in and no bed, no blankets. He was sleeping on the floor. And then at one point, 
I was told by uh, the staff at, at the my alma mater, they was like he was a uh, he was googling uh, mushrooms because he didn't have anything to eat when he went home and he saw mushrooms growing in the woods behind the trailer park. So he was googling mushrooms that were edible so he could figure out what he could eat when he got home. And this, this is sort of the story. It's almost like a a blindside story without the athletic ability because he started talking to this girl and then he would go over to this girl's house and then the girl told her mom like Jesse doesn't have a lot so they uh they start giving him money so he could eat lunch he didn't have no lunch like he, he was he was going to school and just sit around and not eat and then he's going home and not eating and then uh what happened was they they went to the, his trailer one day to drop him off and uh they saw what his living conditions and then Jesse started to hang out at this lady's house who what started out as him talking to her daughter then him and the daughter just became friends they're not dating and this is this is you know this is like sophomore junior high school so the lady was a cafeteria worker at the high school and then she um Jesse would go over there and he stay he stay a couple hours then he starts staying all night then he starts staying staying for weeks and the story I heard was he was over there for like two weeks, just hanging out the house, coming back every day after school. And then they was like, aren't your, uh, where are your parents and grandparents? Nobody's calling for him. He was going to school and doing his work, but he was just hanging out over there. And then they, they took him to the trailer where his grandpa was living. And the grandpa was sitting on the front porch and like waved at him like, eh, like Jesse's been there. Like he ain't seen his grandson in two weeks. And then he shows up and he's kind of waved like not a big deal. And so Jesse went and grabbed his few belongings. And then the the lady, uh, her name was Shelly Pollock, is Shelly Pollock. She ended up becoming his legal guardian when it was all said and done. So when I heard his story, uh, I was like, oh, so I wanted to do something for my alma mater. So I gave him a full ride to Capitol uh, University in Columbus. And... It reminded me when I when I saw what LeBron did with the food pantry for families and the free breakfast, lunch, and sa- snacks. That's huge for some kids. I mean, that's how much thought went into this school because most people just want you know, oh, we opened up a school, but there's so much. He's like what LeBron did, changing the complete uh, direction and breaking the 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 so called broken home chain that because i think a lot of times we repeat what we see as a kid so whatever you whatever you see nine times out of ten you you might repeat that cycle growing up because that's all you know so now lebron is i mean given given jobs to the parents oh my god and then if the parents don't have an education they're going to have ged programs and then to get the university of akron to sign on and so, yeah, we're, we're going to accept these kids to our university. Oh, my God. That, I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like, if you're at that school I, I, and you don't take advantage of all that's offered to you, and that's the thing, too. A lot of the kids, I'm glad he's, I'm glad the school's starting at kindergarten because once you get to, like, ninth and 10th, you know, some of those kids, it's, it's hard to reach at that point because that they don't know. They don't know, like, the advantages they have by going to a school like that. It's almost like when you're, uh, we we used to do things backwards when I was in school growing up. You didn't start taking Spanish till ninth grade. By then, I mean, it's almost like picking up a second language. You know, how you ever see kids that speak like Spanish and English because their parents are Mexican or Puerto Rican? I saw it more in California than Ohio. But you'll see kids whose parents used to come get them from school and parents speaking nothing but Spanish. Kids speaking Spanish, but in school they're speaking English. That's because they they grew up gr- learning both languages as a kid. And it's ninth grade, man. Your brain's already that the back of the brain was that cerebral cortex. It's already closing. Starts closing at like 13, 14. So your brain isn't open. It's harder to learn a, 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 a second language. Uh, so we always did it backwards when I was growing up because we would start learning Spanish in ninth. We should have started learning Spanish in kindergarten. And then you'd have all these bilingual kids. I'm shots like Spanish. Three years in high school, I can count to 10 and I know colors. That's it. Azul, rojo, verde, blanco, negro. <laughs> that's, that's it. 
All right, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, ocho, cinco. I, I mean, I can count. I can count to ten, basically, and I know colors. And I know I don't know why Iglesias is church, and I know uh, what is it? Trabate y cab cabra cabron, cayate y cayate y trabaja cabron. And the only reason I know that's to shut up and work, fool, is I was on stage one time when I first started doing stand up, and I was doing a Mexican room in San Diego. And I was the only white dude on the show, and the comp is a Latino night, and I was getting heckled, and I didn't know how to come back. So I asked somebody, give me something to say to that dude. And somebody said, uh, what do you say? Cayate y trabaja, cabrón. And I never forgot it. For whatever I said, what does it mean? Shut up and work, fool. <laughs> I don't know how that was a put down, but I just remember they told me, they told me that was my uh, my Spanish moment. And I, I really don't know if that's what it really says. So my Spanish speaking uh, listeners, maybe they could tell me. Uh, Callate y trabaja, cabrón. I hope I didn't say anything uh, bad that's going to get people offended. But I, I, I want to be with, with LeBron's I Promise School. Uh, he's not the first athlete to do something like this. I mean, he got the most press, but Jalen Rose has the Jalen Rose Academy. Uh, Alonzo Mourning has a high school named named after him in Miami. And it's like his high school. Like he did so much for the community. And I'm at, oh my God. I remember back in the day, I used to always do Zoe's Summer Groove. Man, that was like the best weekend when when Alonzo was on the heat. And this is this is before LeBron got there. This is like first time I did Zoe's Summer Groove was in 2006, right after they won the NBA title. Oh, it was so lit. It was so we did it at American Airlines Arena. I remember Cat Williams was on the show. Steve Harvey hosted. I was on it. And then I remember I started doing it every year after that. Every year I do Zoe's Summer Groove for about five years straight. And, and then Dwayne got attached. So then it was Zoe and D-Wade's Summer Groove. And then uh, Alonzo retired. And then Dwayne, which, he has just so much else going on. It just kind of went away. Now Zoe does the Winter Groove, but it's not the same, man. God dang, that Summer Groove back in the day? Woo! I remember one time I was doing the summer groove and um, I was bagging on Kenya Martin and I didn't know he was in the audience. And I started talking about how he was always stuttering. He always had a twitch and talk like this and he's twitched and stuttered. And then uh, I was making fun of him because he cussed out Mark Cuban. And I said, man, as soon as he started cussing somebody out, his twitch and his stutter went away. And I started acting like what he, how he cussed out Mark Cuban for the Mavericks. And uh, all of a sudden... Kenyon stood up and I didn't know he was there. And I go, oh shit, you're here? Like I literally turned to a little kid because <laughs> I didn't know he was there. <laughs> and uh, it, it was one of those things you had to be there to appreciate it. But me and Kenyon got cool after that. Uh, but yeah, there's, I mean, I know Magic's done a lot for the community. But, and, and now the thing is, has LeBron passed Jordan as far as like the greatest off the court? I think off the court, Without question, LeBron's been doing things for the community and, and speaking out where where Jordan never really did. Uh, but you know, I remember um, I remember I had a I had a TV show with Shaq called Upload. It was on True TV. We only we only went one season. I'm not gonna lie, I got fired. I got fired from the show. It was two seasons, and they let me go because why I got fired from the show was me and Shaq had a TV show called Upload. When it first started, it was just me and Shaq, and then we did the pilot. And they brought in another comedian that was on the pilot. And then they, th they thought Shaq opened up with two people talking to instead of just one-on-one, -on -one, me and him. And basically, it was uh, it was like America's Funniest Home Videos. We just saw goofy videos and we commented on them. And then we do little sketches and stuff. And me and the other comedian just didn't click. I'm not going to say his name or throw him under the bus because I was just as much as fault as he was. So our personalities just did not click. And it was so tense on set. I got nothing bad to say about the dude. He's a good guy. Um, if you want to look up upload season two, you'll you'll see who it is. Cause then they said, Gary, we're gonna we're gonna go in a different direction. And I was like, I've never been so happy to be fired from a show. <laughs> like, because I didn't look forward to going to work. Cause I was like, oh, it's just our personalities just did not click. Uh but uh <laughs> it was, I remember the season one of upload, we had we always had would have a guest comic. 
And I remember we had Tiffany Haddish was a guest comic and nobody knew who she was. We had Ali Wong, who's killing it right now, a little Asian comic. Nobody knew who she was. And uh, but I remember Shaq telling me a story about Starbucks came to him first to invest in Starbucks. And I remember Shaq's exact words was, was, man, black people ain't drinking coffee like that. But he didn't say black people. But he said the N-word, but I ain't going to say it. But he was like, black people drinking coffee like that because they wanted him to open up Starbucks like in, in black communities, black neighborhoods. And not not necessarily the hood, but black neighborhoods. Like Magic has the, I think his first Starbucks was by LAX. And there's, there's the Magic Johnson TGI Fridays. And then there's the Magic Johnson uh, Starbucks right next to it. And then they went to Shat and then they went to Magic and the rest is history. And I've heard Magic's made just as much money off Starbucks as he did making money when he was playing for the Lakers. Uh, but Shaq was like, man, that's one of my biggest regrets is not doing, not opening up that Starbucks. And Shaq's doing all right now. Like every, when I remember when I was with them, there was a, uh, he had a 24 hour fitness he owned. I want to say a target. Like the dude's got his hands in so much Shaq, those Buick commercials. Shaq ain't ever drove a Buick, by the way, ever. But he's got, I remember, uh, we were shooting the TV show and if you look it up on YouTube, there's a video of it. But I, uh, <laughs> I, I was, I was working out and I, I, uh, I couldn't work out for like a week cause we were filming so much. Then we got off early one day and I said, man, I want to work out. And Shaq goes, go work out on my 24 hour fitness. And I was like, what am I going to do? Just walk in and say Shaq sent me. He goes, yeah. So I go in, I told the dude Shaq sent me and the dude was like, yeah, right. Heard that before. And then I had to go back to Shaq's house and I said, Shaq, man, I went there and the dude didn't let me in. So we did a video where I had Shaq on my phone and I was like, hey, the guy that said uh, I couldn't go in there and work out because you said, yeah, right. And Shaq came behind me in the video and he was like, he good. Let him in. Let him work out. He's fine. And then I came back to Twitter for Fitness and I held my phone up to the dude and dude was like, can't argue with that. And he let me work out. But it was like it was almost like a pretty one woman moment when Julia Roberts went into the store on Rodeo and they didn't want to they didn't want to serve her because she looked like a hooker. And then Richard Gear gave her the credit card and the money, and then she came back to the the boutique store that didn't want to uh, let her shop, and she goes, "Big mistake, huge." It was like my pretty woman moment uh, for that. Uh, other news is uh, Ohio State had. Um, Oh, you know what? Before I get into that, I want to ask you guys a question. Talking about LeBron and, and everything. I don't want to get sidetracked. Um, before I get into Ohio State and Urban Meyer and this domestic violence thing. Uh, back when when we filmed Think Like a Man, the second one, we were in Vegas. And I had a chance to go to Game 7 of the NBA Finals. Because the, the, the Heat won it that year. They beat the Spurs. And Gabrielle, of course, is married to Dwayne. But back then, they were they were engaged. And they worked the shooting schedule out and twisted it around so Gab could fly back to Miami, go to Game 7, and then come back the next day. So they gave her like two days off to make sure she could make the game because it was Game 7. And I, I wasn't shooting that day, those two days either. So Gab said I could hop on. She, she chartered a private jet. I could get on the jet, go to Miami. And then I knew guys in the heat that I could get a ticket to um, Game 7. And uh, my wife wouldn't let me go because her reasoning was, you haven't been home. You got a son. So this is 2013. So my son was 13. So he was on, uh, I guess he was on the seventh grade team then. And he was playing summer, summer league basketball. She goes, you can't, if you can't make it to your son's basketball game, imagine I was going to feel that you flew to Miami to go to game seven, but you didn't fly home to go to his game. And I went, fuck. And I'm trying to come up with a reason. I'm like, but it's a private jet. If I was going to fly from Vegas, I got to go commercial. And if, if you've never flown private, it's completely different. Like you're, you pull up to the, the tarmac and you just get on a plane. There's no security. There's no waiting in line. There's no, uh, we're, we're th third on the runway to take off. There's no delayed flights. No, you show up, you get on a plane and you leave. That's it. If you, if you like, if you say, hey, we're going to leave at 3 o'clock, 2.55, you show up. And you get on a plane, you leave, 3 o'clock. So I'm chilling her. No, it's different. It's a private jet. And I ain't going to lie. I want to go to Game 7, but I was also looking forward to flying on a private jet. I've flown on a private jet 
three times in my life. And there's nothing like it. Uh, nothing like it. Like just when I think I'm doing good in life, I follow too many people on Instagram that have private jets and it brings me down a little bit because I'd be feeling like I'm doing something when I'm flying first. Nah, nah. There's so many people. I, I, I should follow like less famous people with less money on Instagram because I'd be like, God damn it. <laughs> he chartered a jet for that shit. But I had a chance to go to game seven and I didn't go. I didn't go because I kind of saw my wife was saying, how would your son feel if she sees your dad? She said, think about your son. If he's watching game seven, which he would be, and he sees me in the stands and then I'm sitting there just rooting him on and everything. And then I didn't go to his game and he had a game like that same day as game seven. I went, ah, like I had to call Gab and be like, hey, Gab, I can't go. And my wife's not letting me. She goes, all right, then we're taking off. If things change, we got open seats on the plane. And I just remember, I remember watching it and then the heat won and then everybody was partying in Miami. And I remember Terrence J got on the jet with, with Gab. So he went, so I'm looking at his social media and they're at live and they're just partying with, they got the freaking trophy with them. And I'm like, fuck, I really wanted to be there. And I, you know, and now I look now here it is five years later. I'm asking you guys when you watch this, and if you watch it on my YouTube page, you can really make the comments and I'll see them. Should I have gone and said, fuck it? Because still part of me goes, I should have just, I should have said, fuck it and apologized to my son or got like a jersey and gave it to my son. I don't know. Oh, you guys tell me what I should have did. I, I know the dude's going to be like, you stupid ass, you should have went. And I wanted to let my nuts hang in the words of Takashi69 and be like, nah, motherfucker, I'm going. Fuck that. But that dad side of me kicked in. I go, yeah, yeah, I don't want my, I don't, here's the thing. I got disappointed a lot growing up from my dad. So I didn't want my son to be looking at me like this motherfucker, man. He can't go to my games, but he going to go see a bunch of dudes that, that aren't related to him play. I said, like, but it's fuck. It was game seven. I don't know. Does that make me a bad dad? I don't, I don't think it would have been all things I did in my life. If I went to game seven and didn't go to my son's game, I don't know, but leave a comment. Should I have gone? So this, this, let me just lay it out for you. Call my wife. I can go to game seven. Gab chartered a private jet. I can ride with her. We're coming back the next day. Like Gab literally, if the game was on, if the game was Saturday night, Gabrielle left Saturday morning. She was back Sunday evening into Vegas. So she... It was basically two days. It, it was really was a day. You only stayed on night. You only stayed in Miami one night, and so I was my the, my my argument to my wife was, it's a fr- it's a private jet. It's game seven. There, I would go to my son's game if I had a private jet to fly back. That's what I, that was. What I was I was telling her. I go, dude, if I had a private jet, I would be at his games. I would fly in and fly back, and I would no problem. But I'm not at that point. I'm like, I, I have to, I have to get online. Delta, American, United, Southwest, Virgin America. I got to see if I see if I have flights that can get me to and from. Because, I, listen, in my defense, when we shot Think Like a Man 2, I, I was the only one that lived in on the East Coast. So I couldn't go home like the other guys. Other guys, we'd wrap Friday. And most of the guys would just go to the Vegas airport and get on Southwest and book the next flight out. Because Southwest has a flight like every hour from Vegas to L.A. So as soon as we wrapped, I'm telling you, man, Ely, Romney, Ferreira, all those guys, TJ, Terrence, they'd all take off and just head to the airport. And it was funny because I'm sure people was like, what the fuck are you doing on Southwest? But <laughs> there was no like pre-planning. And then they come back Sunday night. They come back Sunday night. So for me, I tried to do that one time. We got off Friday and I said, I'm going to come home. And here's what happened. We got off Friday. I caught the red eye back. I landed Saturday morning. When I got off the plane, and I was going to fly back Sunday evening. So I I just want to come home for a weekend. I got off the plane Saturday morning. So I took off from Vegas like at 11 p.m. It was a direct direct flight into Cincinnati. You lose three hours. So I landed in Cincinnati like at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. I got off the plane. I got a bunch of texts. I got a bunch of... uh, uh, um, voicemail saying, Gary, call us, call us, call us. This is production, call us. I get off the plane Saturday morning. We need you in 
tomorrow morning. We're we're starting at like six a.m. We need you back. I heard you went home because uh, we had to do this casino scene. And so here I am, get off the plane in Cincinnati. I call my wife. I'm like, uh, she was there to pick me up at the airport. We basically went to breakfast. And then I went home and saw my kids, said what up. And then I was on a flight like six hours later back to Vegas because I had to be there Sunday morning to film. And I couldn't be mad at production. And the director, Tim Story, apologized. He goes, look, we got the casino. We got to shoot this scene. We can only do it tomorrow. So look, when they hire me, they paid me to be in Vegas the whole time. If I leave, that's on me to get back in case they call me into work. So I, so I never tried to go home again like that. I never tried to like fly back to Cincy because I was like, damn, they could call me in and I might have to shoot a scene. But uh, the um, with the game seven, I knew I was off those two days because Will Packer, the producer and everybody, he worked it out. So people could go to game seven because we had too many people attached. You know, Lala was dating, dating Carmelo and, and Gab and, and too many, we had too many friends within the heat organization back then. And, and so I don't know. I, I don't know. Looking back on, I should have gone to game seven. I, I, I told my wife, I go, if we had to do that all over again, I would have went and you just been mad at me. And I would have worked it out with my son years later and apologize. We would have just went to counseling. Uh, but that's, that's why I never, I never went home during the whole shoot of Think Like a Man 2 because the one time I tried, and let me tell you what the scene was. If you've seen the movie, it's the scene where I'm at the slot machines with the old ladies and I high five them and all the guys are doing their own thing. But they that was the only time they could get those those three old ladies. And it was the only time we could get, we was at Planet Hollywood, we could get those, those slot machines allotted because you got to cut off a certain segment of the casino when you're shooting. And people can't go through it. So it's best to do it early in the morning or or really late at night. When I say late at night, I'm talking like three in the morning on a weekday. Um, so they we had to shoot that scene like 7 a.m. on a Sunday because the casino wasn't crowded. It wasn't jumping. The casino wasn't going to hold a Friday or Saturday night. Like I bet you 90% of the movie and, and the casino scenes and Think Like a Man, two, we shot, uh, I remember the first day on set, it was like a 2.30 call time. And then everybody got in makeup. And we were shooting at like 3.30 in the morning in Planet Hollywood. And it was hysterical. So our first shoot day for Think Like a Man 2 was when everybody... Remember, if you guys seen the movie, it was where we just got done with Floyd Mayweather. And we were coming down the escalator. And then I would... And, and Kevin was like, you know, I want to... I wanna, that's when he supposedly won at the roulette table. He's telling the guys, we, we got to win some money, man. We in Vegas, da, da, da. And I'm like, no, I want to stand on my own two feet. I got to make a stand. And we shot that scene at four in the morning, like four to six, we got that scene done. And I remember right when we started shooting, this drunk dude just walked into the scene, like first out the bat, we just get to Vegas. I go, there's no way. Just, we didn't know if he was in the scene or not. Because we just we did the rehearsal, and then I thought, oh, they added a drunk dude to the scene. No, this, this drunk motherfucker really walked in the middle of the scene. Hey, what's going on? Like, <laughs> and we were all looking like, was well, he is he an extra? What is it? And, and then he really was just a drunk dude that wandered in to us in the, shooting the scene. But that was, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's just funny because you know. uh, I'll never forget when I, every time I see Think Like a Man 2, I'll be looking at it like, I remember that. Cause when you, here's the thing, when you shoot a movie like that, when you're watching it, just for me, I'm never like watching a movie, like looking at it like, oh, um, like a fan, like, oh, this is a good movie. When I'm watching it, I'm looking at, oh, I remember that day. I remember that, what happened behind the scenes that day. So when we're coming down the escalator after I get beat up by Floyd and his bodyguards, uh, that was the first day of shooting. Like when the Floyd and the bodyguard scene, we shot that like a week later because I remember we were trying to put it together because like, okay, I just got my ass kicked. Uh, and when we come down the escalator, I wasn't acting like I got my ass kicked. And then we had to look up like later on and be like, oh, bro, we should have shot the Floyd shit first because then I would have acted all flustered because I'm coming down the escalator like it's no problem. Not, I mean, you know, but, you know, in the movie, I just got choked out by Floyd's bodyguards. Now I'm just coming down the escalator. Like it's nothing. But it's funny you shoot things out of sequence. 
And then when I watch the movie, when I this is what I do, I'm like, oh, okay, that was the that was the first day of shooting, and that was the day the dude walked in the middle of the scene. And then every time I see that the old ladies and me high fiving them at the slot machines, I was like, that was a scene where I flew all the way back to Cincinnati, landed at 6 a.m. and was on like a 4 p.m. flight back to Vegas. I literally got off. And I always, man, I used to do a joke about it on stage where I said, I got off the plane, got four pumps in with my wife. I didn't have time to fuck her real good. And then, uh, and then I, <laughs> and then I got back on the plane. I got four pumps in. Boom, boom, boom. Still around, baby. Yeah, puss good. And they got back on the plane and headed back to Vegas. That was, that's what I think about when I see that scene, you know, like the, the, the Floyd scene. I remember when we shot it with Floyd. Uh, God, we did like five takes. And I got beat up every which way. And I remember I was sore the next day because his bodyguards are fucking huge. And they manhandled me. Like one scene I got choked out. One I got in an arm bar. One I got lifted up. Like I was beat up. Like I I really felt like a a WWE wrestler after that day. Because they, and I'm a big dude, but they fucked me up shooting that movie. Uh, So this is the good thing about my podcast. How the hell... Did I go from LeBron opening up a school to Jalen Rose, Alonzo Mourning, to Game 7, to now I was talking about getting my ass kicked for the last five minutes and think like a man too. My, I should change my, uh, my podcast name to Fuck It because that's really where I'm at. Because sometimes I catch myself, like my ADHD kicks in, I talk to myself a lot. Like I, I call it Get Some, but I should really call it Fuck It because I just realized... My ramble right now had nothing to do with where I started. I started out with LeBron's I Promise School, and I got to the point where it was, I got beat up by Floyd's bodyguards, and this dude walked into the middle of a scene to think like a man too. All right, so enough on LeBron and, and the I Promise School. Uh, he, I, and LeBron's quickly becoming the Muhammad Ali of basketball with his philanthropy work. I, I know I didn't say that right. Philanthropy, philanthropy, philanth- with all the shit he does. For everybody. LeBron's quickly become an Ali of basketball. Because, you know, uh, you know, Ali, great boxer, one of the greatest ever. Uh, but it was everything he did outside the ring. And it's the same with LeBron. I remember when um when Trayvon Martin, the shooting. I mean, I LeBron and Dwayne was the the main guys, like they had their hoodies up. Speaking of that, if you haven't seen that on I think I think it's on ESPN. Or no, no, is it ESPN? I think it's ESPN. No, I don't know if it's ESPN or is it Showtime or HBO. Fuck. One they, they they're doing the 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 Trayvon Martin the the um, they they said uh God what's it called ah oh, fuck. Anyways, just find it. I you know what I'm gonna look it up. I think it's I think it's is, is it on Showtime or HBO? Uh, I'm gonna Google. I watched the first episode. Uh, at that shit is good. Trayvon Martin story. It's on, hold on guys, Rest in Power, uh, Trayvon Martin's story, oh, BET, I'm sorry, BET's airing it, yeah, Rest in Power, the Trayvon Martin story, God, make sure you watch that, go to, go to, um, On Demand, and, um, it's, it's, it's eye-opening, it's, it's behind the scenes, cause I'm, I remember when the, when that Trayvon Ma- Martin story first broke, uh, it was funny how the the media will twist things because they kept showing images of him with the gold teeth or like like just trying to act hard. But I was just like, it's just being a teenager and you don't know what his post was. There could have been a caption to it like him goofing off. And uh, to this day, that 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 case more than more than any others. If you don't know George Zimmerman uh, was completely at fault. Come on now. The way he's reacted and the way Trayvon Martin's parents have carried themselves, that lets me know everything I need to know about that case. Because the way they've conducted themselves, I, and I really think you're, I think that gives you an insight into what, what Trayvon Martin was like uh, and the way George Zimmer has conducted himself since the, the, the trial. I mean, that tells you everything you need to know about that. But if you get a chance, go to BET, go to On Demand, and watch I, I, the first two episodes. Oh my god, it's just eye opening. It's eye opening. Uh, so yeah, if if you're gonna watch anything, watch those two things. 
Uh, now, football season's in full swing right now. Uh, the preseason started, uh, and I had, I had a discussion with some strange dude uh, on the street, basically, and he, he was like a Cleveland fan, and he was like, yo, G, we coming for you this year. We coming for you. And I'm just like, dude, why don't you focus on Pittsburgh? Why? That's the thing. Cleveland and Cincinnati, we should not be arguing with each other at all. If you a Cleveland Browns fan and you a Cincinnati Bengals fan, what the fuck we arguing for? We should both be ganging up on Pittsburgh. So every time a Cleveland fan comes to me, man, and I'm in Cleveland next week, uh, August 16th to 19th, we need to worry about Pittsburgh. We we got two teams that ain't been in the playoffs in years, and what the fuck we arguing for? And that's the thing. Cleveland's got some players now. I wanted Cincinnati to get them early when the schedule came out. I go, please let us get Cleveland early. We got in the middle of the season. By then, they might have figured it out. And if that Josh Gordon comes back healthy, whew, they got a video of him working out. And his Instagram is at Flash. And hold on, ADHD moment. Uh, I'd say if you're going to follow any people on Instagram, Will Smith and Arnold Schwarzenegger are two of my favorites. Like, Will Smith started late, but his I don't know what camera crew he's got. And what graphics, I, but I'm like, dude, I'm looking at my web guy like, what the fuck, dude? What are you doing? We're in the Stone Age here. But then I realize it's Will Smith. I try to temper it. And and Arnold's is good just because it's Arnold. Just hearing him talk is funny. Uh, and he'd be digging on Trump, Schwarzenegger, on, on the low. It's so good. Like him and Will's are two of my favorites. But Josh Gordon's Instagram is Flash. He just got at Flash. And... uh. Dude, he got a video. Let me see if I can find it. He got a video of him working out. It pisses you off. Like, a guy should not be built like that. Like, I just left the gym when I see him working out. It's, oh, this dude. If he comes back and his head's on straight, fuck you, man. Like, and he's still only like 26. He's not old. Like, 27, 28. He's, not, he's definitely not 30. And that's the thing about quarterbacks. I was thinking, like, he was at Baylor when RG3 was there. And it's very similar to to Johnny Manziel and uh, Mike Evans. Like Manziel had all the hype, but every time I would watch Texan and play, I go, "That wide receiver is kind of good." And then Evans, he's balling in Tampa. And then same thing, RG three really good at Baylor, but I remember watching him going, "Josh Gordon's pretty fucking good that wide receiver." And and look what's happening now. Like it, I was, I was so happy to see RG three back in the NFL playing for the Ravens because Lamar Jackson got all the hype. But um, RG3 did his thing, and I don't know if the Ravens can keep him because uh, Flacco's going to be the starter at the beginning of the year. There's no doubt. Unless they start tanking, Flacco's playing for the Ravens. And why would you have RG3 there when you drafted Lamar Jackson? Basically, you're grooming him to take over and change the offense. Uh, so I think RG3, I, I hope, he, I hope he, he balls out and another team picks him up. Honestly, I wouldn't be upset if the Bengals went after him to back up Andy. Just change of pace. I don't want to see Andy Dalton get hurt. Uh, I want him to, to play and be healthy. But we ain't got no backups. Uh, I think I think Barkley's. I think he's proven he's kind of terrible. I, I we're not going to go anywhere. If, if Andy gets hurt, the season's kind of over with our backups uh, since he's got. So I wouldn't mind seeing like a veteran change of pace type dude. I don't think has Cincinnati ever had a black quarterback that played. I'm thinking they had to. They had the one guy was a backup for a couple years, but he never played. Like ten years ago, they had a backup, but they and they had Josh Johnson in camp, but I don't think he played. But I don't think since they ever had a starting black quarterback, the Bengals. I don't think they have. I'm thinking no. I don't. I don't think they've ever had a a, a black quarterback. That would be kind of dope to have a mobile quarterback back there. Uh, if the Bengals, I'm looking them up. It's crazy. Google, you can look up everything. I'm gonna literally, I'm googling Cincinnati Bengals black quarterback, and I'm gonna see what pops up. Uh, black quarterback. Google search, and uh, oh, the fuck did I forget? Achilles Smith. Jesus Christ, I'm a dumb. And Jeff Blake. My fault. Bengals have had a ton of good black. Not good. We've had black quarterbacks. Not good. Uh, Jeff was good. Achille, ah, but <laughs> my dumb ass, and I'm a huge fan. Uh, that's great. Google, you can look up everything. 
You can look up everything on Google. <laughs> now Jeff Blake, yeah, he threw the he threw the rainbow bombs. I used to love watching him play. Uh, yeah, Achilles Smith. Oh my God, how did I forget that? Talk about fucking up the entire direction of the team. Because remember the year Achilles Smith came out was the year Ricky Williams came out from Texas, and they the 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 Mike Dicka offered everything. He offered the Saints' entire draft for like 10 years to the Bengals so they could move up and grab Ricky Williams. And Mike Brown said, no, we're going to get Achilles Smith. What the fuck? Man, that changed the whole direction. That was that was almost like the Herschel Walker trade. Back in the day when the, uh, the Cowboys traded Herschel Walker to Minnesota and got all those draft picks, which basically catapulted them to the Super Bowl and all them runs, it's the same thing. Same thing. God dang. Takes me back to a dark time. What I'm hearing, what I'm hearing about the Bengals right now, though, what I'm hearing is uh, the wide receivers are going nuts. The young wide receivers that out in Tate's balling. John Ross is healthy balling. They cut Brandon LaFell. Joe Mix is doing well. Uh, G- Gio Bernard, we know he's going to do his thing. But uh, the, what I hear is it's, uh, our whole season is predicated on the offensive line. The whole season. We got Glenn. I heard he's doing okay. Not doing great. Doing okay. I heard Cedric Obwehi, who was our tackle last year, that got Andy damn near killed. Whew. Not hearing good things about him either. So, hopefully, the offensive line steps up. Now, here's... And I've got, I've got completely sidetracked. But, then, okay, here's how I'll segue this. Ohio State. Uh, the Bengals drafted Billy Price. I heard he's doing okay. Uh, but Ohio State had the big scandal got broke this week. Urban Meyer and his assistant uh, back in 2015, the wide receivers coach, uh, had domestic violence against his wife. And then uh, this guy goes on ESPN and does an interview, and it was disturbing the way he talked. Um, I was just like, the way he was talking about his wife and how, how uh, was it? Zach Smith's his name. Zach Smith was uh, one of the coaches at Ohio State, and they got all these charges and accusations of domestic violence against his wife. And then he, and then come to find out, Urban Meyer knew about him and kept him on the staff. And then Urban Meyer went to Media Day and acted like he didn't know nothing about it, really. And like he was in the dark. And come to find out, he did know. So now Urban Meyer is suspended. And this Zach Smith with the interview with SPN and the way he talked was aggressive. I was like, uh, and he, he said, yeah, I never hit my wife. It was all defense. If I, if I touched her, it was defense. And like, she's got videos of her with cut hands and bruises on her body. He goes, no, it was all just me trying to get away. And I'm like, dude, but then he said, yeah, I, I used to push her buttons though. I knew how to push her buttons. And I'm like, dude, that interview didn't do you any justice. After I saw the interview, I was like, oh yeah, he, he did that shit. He did it. And I think his wife probably, it was a volatile relationship. I think this this Zach Smith, this coach at Ohio State, uh, I think he knew how to push his wife's buttons to get her going. I think she knew how to push his buttons to get him mad. It's just a volatile relationship. But under any circumstances, he never hit a chick. Ever. You just got to walk away. I always say you don't even hit a dude. Walk away from dudes. I walk away from everybody. You can't, there's nothing you can say to me make me want to make me want to hit you. I just leave. I always think about uh tomorrow is it gonna be worth it? Is it gonna be if I get in a fight with this, is it worth it? Do I want to be on World Star knocked out? I don't want to take that chance. Mm-mm. I've had dudes try to test me a couple of times, like, mm-mm, I just leave. I just leave. I had one guy, okay, this uh, this is a funny story. I was like 20 years old. I was at this bar and I, I was in the military and I came home to Cincinnati, and it was this bar called Cooters. Back in the day, it was on it was on UC's campus called Cooters, and I leaned up against the rail. I was on the dance floor. I leaned up, and I my the, my back hit this guy's hand, and the guy I said, "Oh, my fault." And the guy goes, "You call me a pussy," and I went, "What?" And he, I go, "No, I, I said my fault." He goes, "Oh, I thought you called me a pussy." I said, "No, nah, I, I didn't call you a pussy." He's like, "Oh, because I was gonna say you called me a pussy. We got some problems." He started going off, and I said, "Dude." I just told you I didn't call you a pussy. If I was going to call you a pussy, I'd call you a pussy. And I yelled, <laughs> man. Uh, and keep in mind, I had a couple of drinks. Even though I was 20, I had a couple of beers in me. 
So the dude did like a karate kid on me. He had like his two boys on either side. He was like, Johnny, Bobby, let's get him. So then, so now the way the dance floor is set up, there's a rail. Like, like the dance floor is like this big wooden floor, but there's a big rail, like a bar that goes all around and people can stand at the rail and put their drinks on this little bar. And so I'm in the dance floor. I'm like, oh shit, but again, mask it. Keep in mind, I'm the tourist for going places by myself. I always like travel light, travel right. So I'm at this bar by myself and this dude and his two cronies are coming for me. So I start literally running around the the dance floor and jumping and hitting myself and the chest go, yeah, I've been waiting for this shit. Motherfuckers always fucking me up, but I'm jumping. I'm jumping like a rabbit, like in a row. And all I'm doing is, where the fuck is security? Where the fuck is security to break this up? And right when the guys are about to get me, all the security came in and swooped in and all the security guys had like referee shirts on. Cause it was like a, they, they cooters like a sports bar in city. And the minute they came in and the chaos erupted, like the bounce breaking up, I stood out the back and I was in my car on my knees, like getting in my car and opening. I'm looking to my right and left. And then I got my car and I remember I was sweating. I was like, Ooh, that was close. <laughs> I remember I stopped at White Castle to eat on the way home. And then I went to my cousin's house and telling him, dude, I was going to fight, but I got out of it. But I didn't get in a fight. But these dudes tried to jump me. And they're like, dude, stop, slow down. But I just remember the dude was like, hey, man, you call me a pussy? I was like, nah, man, I was going to call you a pussy. I call you a pussy. And I yelled. <laughs> I was like, but this is a dude that just wanted to fight somebody. Like, for me to hit his hand and immediately apologize. And then he goes, oh, did you call me a pussy? No. I said, excuse me. How do you get, hey, First of all, my back's to you. So you think I want to just hit your hand softly with a small of my back and then say, you're a pussy? That doesn't make any sense. Dude was just trying to start a fight. But I got out of it. So I wonder what that dude's now doing now in life. Who knows? That was like 20 years ago. Over that. So anyways, uh, LeBron, great job. Open up the I Promise School. And Jalen Rose and Alonzo Mourning. Also, two other guys that don't get enough credit for for. Giving back to your their communities. God dang. I mean, Jalen is tied at the hip to Detroit. Uh, just like LeBron is with Akron, just like Alonzo is with Miami. Uh, and look, man, Cleveland fans out there, stop. If you see me on the street, you know I'm a Bengals fan, don't come at me sideways. Focus on Pittsburgh. We gotta come together, say fuck the Steelers. Cause they're really the big brother. We're like the little stepbrother that was adopted from a group home. Missing limbs. That's what we are. We are disabled orphan kids right now. Cleveland and Cincinnati. So stop bagging on each other and let's come together. Like, I ain't gonna lie. Week one, Cleveland's playing Pittsburgh. I'm rooting for Cleveland like they're the Bengals. Because last year they almost beat Pittsburgh week one. I'll never forget it. But you just gotta, just like when Cincinnati plays Pittsburgh, you got a feeling something's gonna go wrong. You just gotta, even when they're up, you're like, I got a feeling something's gonna go left. So yeah. So, listen, I'm in Tacoma this weekend at Tacoma Comedy Club. And next week, I'm in Cleveland uh, at the Improv. Oh, and while I'm at Cleveland Improv, I'm going to be filming my sets all that weekend and sending them to Netflix. Netflix called me, and they they want to see my hour, which is farther than I've ever gotten with them. So, uh, if you want to see the hour that will, I'm going to put it out there in the universe. It's going to be my Netflix special. You want to be in Cleveland August 16th to the 19th at, at the Improv. All right, y'all. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. If you want to listen to my podcast, just go to iTunes, search Gary Owen, hashtag Get Some.